Hello and welcome back to the Chronicles of Aguna, the Arsenal podcast brought to you by loserpool.com. As ever, I'm your host, Harry Simiou. And uh, this show is sponsored by loserpool.com. It's a fantastic new betting game. If you haven't already, do head over to their website, www.loserpool.com. Sign up, get involved. There are some brilliant cash prizes to be won. You won't want to miss out. Um, and, you know, to top it all off, it's great fun. So let's begin uh, from the pre-match, I suppose. Let's let's look at Unai Emery's team selection and how we lined up up at the Etihad or the Empty Had, as it's become known of late. Um, when I saw the team sheet, I must admit, I thought that Arsenal were playing with three centre-backs. Uh, I'm not going to lie, I'm being completely honest. And, you know, when you looked at it, it was Leno, Licksteiner, Mustafi, Koscielny, Monreal, Kalasinac, uh, sorry, almost a jacker there, Guendouzi, Torreira, and then Iwobi, Aubameyang and Lacazette. And, and you kind of thought that Monreal was going to tuck in as a third centre-half perhaps with Kalasinac uh, and Licksteiner playing as wing-backs. But to my surprise, when the game started, that wasn't the case. Um, Arsenal had actually lined up in a 4-4-2 system, uh, which was, you know, surprising to say the least. Um, not something I can remember us using this season, or certainly not from the start of a game. We might have switched into it, uh, you know, when chasing a goal or something like that from time to time. But it's never been our system from the start. Uh, not that I can remember anyway. But yeah, so, you know, surprised straight away to see see the way we lined up. Um, if Unai Emery was adamant on playing that system. A little bit surprised as to why Kalasinac was playing as a, a wide midfield player. I know that he gets forward quite effectively and he has you know, contributed to a lot of goals this season in terms of assists and even got a couple himself. But for me, I, I find that a bit strange because I think with fullbacks, when they get forward from the fullback position, they come late. They arrive late. They're undetected most of the time, more often than not. And that's why they're effective. The minute you play those players in an actual midfield position, a wide midfield position, then all of a sudden the element of surprise is gone, isn't it? They're, they're marked for the entire game. Um, and, and it's just a completely different kettle of fish. When you when you come in late um, as a wing back, you know, as I said, you come in undetected, you come in late and people often don't expect you to arrive. So, it's it's a very different position, and I just think that you know that is a questionable decision on Unai Emery's part. Um, but anyway, let, forget about that because, in actual fact, Arsenal had basically thrown the game away inside a minute anyway when Alex Iwobi decided to try and dribble his way out of trouble. Um, it, it was a bit of an embarrassing situation to be honest because right from the off we were pinned back and we had pretty much all 10 outfield players inside our own penalty box. Ball breaks to Matteo Guendouzi. I think he should smash it clear, but, um, you know, we're a team who are obsessed with playing out from the back. Unai Emery's drilled that into the players. And perhaps that played on, on Matteo Guendouzi's mind when he decided to play the ball to the right-hand side to Alex Iwobi. Now, Alex Iwobi took the ball under control pretty comfortably, um, but then he dilly-dallied on it, didn't he? And, and he ended up losing possession. The cross came in and there was Sergio Aguero, a striker who, who doesn't make mistakes in front of goal, does he? More often than not, Sergio Aguero finds the back of the net. And, you know, it doesn't matter what, what game plan Unai Emery had at that point. It didn't matter how much preparation he'd put on the training ground during the week or how much of a surprise the 4-4-2 was to Manchester City. The fact was that we found ourselves a goal down within a minute. And, and so your game plan goes out the window. Um, but then, t to Arsenal's credit, I thought we played pretty well after that for a, a, quite a, a long period of time. And we ended up finding an equaliser. It was a set piece. Um, the flick on at the near post, I think, was from Monreal. And, and Laurent Koscielny was there to, to stoop and head it into the back of the net. And you're thinking, great, we've dragged ourselves back into this game. Um, you know, against all odds and having started so poorly, we're now back in it and the momentum is with us. And, 
you've got to say, for the most part of the first half. Arsenal looked pretty comfortable. Yes, City had lots of the ball. Um, Arsenal kind of threatened to do something on the break a couple of times. The final pass was just missing. I remember one particular instance when Lacazette uh, tried to play Aubameyang in behind, but Edison was on his toes and he came out and cleared it. So, you know, it was so far so good and, and half time started to um, to approach and, and you thought, you know what, guys, we've done all right here. We really have done all right. Arsenal are going to go in level at half time at the Etihad, having gone behind inside a minute and you feel like the pressure had been lifted off Alex Iwobi's shoulders as a result of us getting that equaliser and, you know, we can really push on here. But a lapse bit of defending again cost us and this time it was Stefan Lichsteiner's fault, I think. Um, I've watched it a couple of times. I, I, I guess the blame lies with him. Um, and all of a sudden, you know, it's a, it's a typical Manchester City goal, ball up across the box and Aguero's there to tap it into an empty net. Now, the thing with Manchester City is, and, and people who have studied Pep Guardiola's style of football or watched any sort of um, interviews or, or analysis with any of his ex-players will, will tell you this. Pep Guardiola's side specialise in making the pitch as wide as they possibly can. That's what it's all about. It's about making as much room as you can. It's about pulling defenders out of position. It's about... Uh, opening gaps between defenders and, and creating the spaces for your runners to get into. And and I think there was a good piece of analysis, I think it was a couple of years back now, where Thierry Henry spoke about how when playing under Guardiola, he was told to pull right onto that touchline. Um, and you know what, if the defender follows you out there, then he's left a massive hole between him and the centre-back. But if he doesn't, you've got space to receive the ball. Now, Raheem Sterling was doing that all day long. He, he's a fantastic footballer. Um, I always say that he's England's most talented individual. But he kept pulling out to that to that left flank, didn't he? He kept receiving the ball right on the touchline. And then Stefan Lichstein has got a problem because does he go out there? Does he confront him? Does he try and get tight with him? But then you run the risk of him skipping past you or you're leaving a massive hole between you and your centre-back. So... That's a common issue caused by sort of the way Pep Guardiola's wingers operate. And in order to try and counter that and not leave gaps between our defence, it was as though Unai Emery had instructed our team to play very narrow uh, and be very compact. And a, a colleague of mine on another podcast today said that you could have thrown a blanket over the Arsenal defence. That's how compact and narrow they were. And that's absolutely right. But the issue with that is you're then allowing... Raheem Sterling, for example, to get the ball under his spell and run at you. Now, I don't care how good a defender you are in a one-on-one -on -one situation. When a player is tricky, as quick and as, as talented as Raheem Sterling's driving at you with the ball at his feet, you've got problems. You know, the minute you give him that space to get going and get, uh, you know, sorry, find his stride, then you've got a real problem, haven't you? Because you're not really going to, win the ball back unless you clatter him the chances of of him skipping past you are pretty high if you dive in he'll probably go the other way it's, it's a really difficult situation but Manchester City are better than anyone at exploiting those areas and pulling the ball back across goal back across the six yard box and you know we paid the penalty for that and and it just felt as though with our fullbacks being pulled into those positions I'd have liked to have seen particularly in Serd Kalasinac's case, where he's actually a left back, I'd have liked to have seen him protect Nacho Monreal a little bit more on that side, and and Alex Iwobi should have protected Lichtsteiner more, but that wasn't happening. And then what happens is Torreira and Guendouzi get pulled out into those positions, and then all of a sudden, Manchester City's midfield runners and the likes of Kevin De Bruyne are able to break right at the heart of your defence and right on onto your back four and, and dominate possession and, and eventually strangle you. And that's kind of what happened. But for me, you know, the first half wasn't all doom and gloom. It was two poor moments, really, from an Arsenal perspective. Manchester City hadn't done a great deal uh, in terms of opening us up. I thought Arsenal would cope pretty well. I thought as the half went on, we grew into the game. But then half time came. And you thought, you know what, we are 2-1 down, but we're still very much in this game. It's only one goal 
And, uh, you know, we've got Lacazette on the pitch. We've got Aubameyang on the pitch. And, you know, let's have a go at Manchester City. Why not? We've got the talent to hurt them. So the second half begins and the the performance just dropped completely. I mean, I think that the whole team looked absolutely knackered. Other people have said that too, um, which shouldn't be the case, should it? You know, professional footballers playing in the Premier League shouldn't be... Um, blowing out of their asses just after half time. I thought that Manchester City just controlled possession even more so than they had in the first half. And we were chasing shadows for the most part. But I think the most disappointing thing about that second half was the fact that we didn't even have an attempt at goal. So you're chasing the game. You're just a goal behind Manchester City. You've got bags of striking talent on the pitch, but you don't create anything and you don't even have an attempt at goal. For me, that's not acceptable and and this is where I kind of take issue with, with Unai Emery now because you're talking about a lack of creativity and I know we say this all the time and, and I say this all the time on this podcast and I say it on other podcasts and radio shows too but you can't complain about not creating chances and then leave Mesut Ozil and even Aaron Ramsey, even Denis Suarez, I know he's brand new and yeah, there's a very strong argument that he shouldn't have been thrown in. I get that. So I'm not overly fussed about that one. But Ramsey and Ozil to, were both left on the bench. And as a result, there was no one breaking forward to join the strikers as Aaron Ramsey would. And there was nobody capable of, of threading a pass through the eye of a needle to try and get our players in behind. So you can talk about Ozil being a passenger when he's on the pitch in this type of fixture. But in fact, Arsenal had two passengers on the pitch because neither of our strikers had any impact on that game. You know, you'd have been better off playing Aaron Ramsey um, as opposed to one of the forwards and asking him to drop back in the midfield when we were defending, uh, be an extra body. But also, he's got the ability to push on and get involved higher up the pitch and, and cause teams problems. So for me... It just didn't make sense, you know, and I felt it was really, really negative. It felt as though Unai Emery had just kind of accepted that the game was over at half time. And, and for me, that's not on. Um, you know, Mustafi went off injured late on with sort of a, a head problem or, he, you know, he'd been involved in a clash. And Unai Emery, his comments were lost in translation, but he mentioned something about Mustafi's head. Lots of jokes going around about that. But, you know, then Mavropanos comes on as a straight swap. And I just think, you know, you're three, one down. There's not really long to go. Is there, why not throw a forward player? Why not throw a forward thinking player on instead? Um, and, and, you know, ask Monreal to drop into center back, tuck Kolasinac back a little bit and, and try and give Manchester city something to worry about in the last 10, 15 minutes. And it just felt as though we'd given up. Arsenal were resigned to defeat. And, you know, of course, the reaction after Arsenal get beat is always a bad one. It's probably all, always over the top as well. And I, I, I'm probably guilty of that sometimes as well when I take to Twitter straight after a game. And I guess, you know, that's probably why I don't record these podcasts immediately after games. And I normally wait till the next day because you watch it back. You think calmly, um, a little bit more rationally, and, and you can kind of make better judgments in that frame of mind. So... Yes, there was an overreaction, um, but this overreaction, I can't speak for everyone else, but for myself, this overreaction was because I've been fed up of watching Unai Emery change things constantly. Um, you know, a manager who came into the club and, and we heard so much about his philosophy, his ethos, yet the ethos and philosophy that he started the season with has been abandoned. And now, after a series of of sort of worse results. You know, we went on that great run. Then we had a little bit of a blip, didn't we? Um, we? We lost a couple of games and we drew a couple of games. And then it was as though Unai Emery had given up faith in what he had been doing so far this season and started changing it. And it feels like he's a desperate man now looking to change things every week in, in hope that what he does is going to work. It's going to click and that Arsenal are going to perform well and win a game. Um, you know, consistently, because we have performed well at times this season. But the worrying thing is that I can count those times on one hand. 
if I think about it, it's probably the Spurs game, Liverpool uh, at the Emirates, Chelsea um, and, and Fulham are probably the four games that come to mind. I might have missed one, but just thinking off the top of my head now, that's what comes to my head. And it, it baffles me because I would like to see Unai Emery give it a good go. Um, the Unai Emery way, but the problem is I don't know what the Unai Emery way is anymore because I've seen so many different formations, so many team selections in the past few weeks that, you know, surely the players are starting to think as well, does this guy know what he's doing? Does he believe in what he's doing? And and I can't, it sounds silly, but I, I'd kind of prefer it if Unai Emery just had a, a system, had an 11, obviously given that they're all fit, um, and try to stay as close to that 11 as he possibly could, obviously injuries permitting, and played the same system week in, week out, to the point where we're improving in that in that way of playing, in that style. You know, Jurgen Klopp, when he first came to Liverpool, you know, it didn't really work straight away, but you could see what he was trying to do because the system, the formation was consistent. Now, yes, the top managers do tweak their systems, depending on their opponents, but you can only tweak a system once you understand the basic concepts of that system. And Arsenal right now, in my view, look like a team who don't know what they're supposed to be doing from week to week because it's changing all the time. So, you know, Unai Emery for me got it wrong again. Um, I'm not saying I want him sacked. And I get so many tweets every time I do one of these podcasts from people telling me that, Give him time, give him time, give him time, give him a couple of transfer windows. Well, first of all, the first thing I'll say is there's no point in giving transfer windows to a manager at a club who quite clearly don't want to spend any money and don't want to back him. They gave him £70 million in the summer. Um, you know, maybe they didn't give it directly to Unai Emery, but they spent £70 million. Who brought the players in? Uh, I don't know for sure. It seems like somebody else had a hand in that rather than Unai Emery making the decisions. If the structure was working as we're told it should have been working, then it would have been Sven Mislintat, it would have been Ralph and Leahy maybe um, bringing those players in. But it feels like we've spent £70 million. We've brought in four defensive-minded players. None of them have improved us defensively. So as a board, you're probably looking at that and thinking that's bad business. And, and if you're Stan Kroenke probably thinking I've given you 70 million pounds you've not used it wisely now I'm not giving you anything in January and that's probably what's happened isn't it um and you know in the summer again the transfer budget I don't think will be anything uh, to shout about I think that Arsenal of course are very keen on on operating in a self-sustaining way and that's Kroenke's business plan and the longer we stay out of the Champions League, the longer that's going to continue because at the end of the day, we're a Europa League club now and we need to work to our Europa League budget. So the longer this goes on, the harder it's going to be to get out of it. You can't see Stan Kroenke putting his hand in his pocket and investing in the players we need. Um, so the solution is we need to find a manager who can get a maximum out of this group. And I don't think... You know, for all the faults that this squad of players have, I don't think that Unai Emery is getting the maximum out of them. I think there's more to Skodran Mustafi than what we're seeing. You know, Stefan Lichtsteiner, yeah, he's aged, but you don't just become a shit fullback overnight, having won so many titles with Juventus. You look at Lucas Torreira and, and the way he started his Arsenal career, and you think there's more than what we're currently seeing in there. Aubameyang scoring goals for fun this season but even him you look at him and you think there's more to this guy he can do more than he's currently doing and you know Mesut Ozil's in the squad and he's not getting a look in Aaron Ramsey yeah he's off but at the moment he's still an Arsenal player so why not use him why not try and get the maximum out of him the, the fact of the matter is that the money situation isn't going to change while Stan Kroenke's in charge Arsenal are never going to go out and spend huge money on signings without bringing in huge money for players that we've sold. At the moment, we haven't got any assets worth a great deal of money to do, say, what Liverpool did, sell a Coutinho and, and fund uh, the revolution. We can't do that because we don't have those assets. We've got Mesut Ozil there on a bumper contract who, 
you know, is not a silly man. He's not going to walk away, is he? He's, he's happy to take that kind of money week in, week out, and who wouldn't be? So it just feels like people are, are giving Emery the benefit of the doubt because, A, it's early, and that's right. They're correct to do so. But, B, because they think he hasn't been back yet, and they think that he needs a few transfer windows. Well, I'm telling you as an Arsenal supporter that he won't be backed. He won't be backed enough to achieve the things he needs to achieve, uh, you know, from a, a financial point of view. The club are not going to say, here's 50 million, go and get yourself a centre-half. Here's 40 million, go and get yourself a centre-midfielder. We're quite clearly shopping in the bracket below the likes of City, the likes of Liverpool. So we need a manager who's more pragmatic than Unai Emery, who's able to get results um, consistently, who has a system that the players can buy into and a system that they can master. I I personally think that somebody like Rafa Benitez would have this team more well-drilled than Unai Emery does. Um, you know, when you look at the job he's doing at Newcastle at the moment, they're defending pretty well for a side uh, battling for relegation. But that is a championship squad that he's got at his disposal, yet he's able to get the maximum out of that group of players. Imagine you had a manager at Arsenal that could get the maximum out of our group because our defensive individuals are not as bad as some of the the other clubs who have better defensive records than us. So what does that tell you? It's a tactical issue. It's a system problem. Yes, there are a lot of individual errors in there too. Alex Iwobi yesterday was a prime example of that. But, you know... Aside from that, tactically, we're all over the shop. Uh, and, you know, I'm starting to lose a little bit of faith in Unai Emery. I, I hope that I'm wrong. I hope that we, we make the top four. And even if we don't make the top four, as long as we give it a good go and we're still in the hunt come the last few weeks of the season, I'll, I'll, I'd say that's progress. And I'd say that Unai Emery deserves another year. But for me, I always question whether Unai Emery was actually Arsenal's first choice because... The fact that he's been given a two-year contract uh, kind of tells me that he's only got two years to do something here. Uh, and if a club had real faith in the manager, they'd probably give him a three, four-year deal. So I was surprised at that. And, you know, I think what's probably happened is Unai Emery was interviewed along with a, a load of other candidates. And Unai Emery was probably the only one willing to work in the way that Arsenal wanted him to work. And what I mean by that is work under a director of football, work under a head of recruitment um, and and work on a, a low budget. Now, Unai Emery's worked on low budgets before, hasn't he? He was at Valencia when they were in dire straits uh, financially. Um, He'd done a, a, a decent job at Sevilla. People always talk about those Europa League trophies that he won. I'm not taking that away from him because it is a good achievement, but the Europa League wasn't as valuable as it is now back then because there wasn't a Champions League spot up for grabs as a result uh, and that you know that's added an edge to the Europa League you know you saw how seriously we took it last season uh, once we'd gotten to the knockout stages at least so yeah I mean look, a game like Manchester City away doesn't make or break your season I don't think that we have any right to go there and win I didn't expect us to go there and win but what I did expect was, having been in the game at half-time, I expected Arsenal to be a little bit more positive and, and try and get themselves back in the game. And I felt that Emery's tactics prevented us from doing that. I felt that Emery's substitutions prevented us from doing that. Uh, you know, poor Denis Suarez comes on, uh, you know, and, and didn't really have a, a, any impact. But that's understandable. It's not the ideal debut for a player like Suarez, especially someone who prides himself on his technical ability and being a bit of a luxury player, if I'm honest. You know, we're chasing goals, Mesut Ozil still can't get on the pitch. There's just so many things I'm questioning at the minute. And um, yeah, like I said, I I'm starting to lose faith a little bit in Unai Emery's methods. I hope I'm wrong. We've got a, a decent run of fixtures coming up. Hopefully he can go on a little bit of a run and restore some confidence uh, and get us back to back to winning ways. Right, that's enough from me. I've rambled on for long enough. Uh, so let's hear from Mike Stavrou. 
Man City 3, Arsenal 1, and the story really has not much to do with the actual action on the pitch, more so to do with the fact that the LA Rams were in the Super Bowl last night, Stan Kroenke's um, pet, the Rams, um, who he built a $1 billion stadium for, while he remains the only investor of any Premier League club um, to not have put any of his own money into it. And really, that complete stark difference um, in the teams uh, from from the top. You know, all of uh, Man City's Arab owners were there supporting um, their team while Stan was, you know, up in um, in Atlanta to watch the Super Bowl. And that's, that's the difference, really. Ultimately, um, before we even go into what happened on the pitch, um, when you look at the investment that um, the Arab owners have put into City, they've pumped money in to the point where they have you know, two, three quality players per position and we're struggling to even field, you know, um, four defenders. Uh, Stefan Lichsteiner wouldn't even call a defender. I don't know what he was doing for that second goal. It's absolutely all over the place and ultimately that's where the difference lies. Man City invested, um, I think it was over 100 million, 150 million in fullbacks last year. Uh, Mendy, Danilo and Carl Walker while, you know, we're struggling with... Um, our usual right back Hector Bellerin who's improved he's out and then uh, on the other side Serk Lassenach we got on a free uh, Lichsteiner also on a free Monreal's ageing we haven't replaced him and I think this whole squad requires a lot of surgery um, from from the, from the top down really the entire squad I think we've got decent attackers um, we've got some good midfielders uh, but ultimately no width in, in our play uh, the only creativity comes from the wing backs, you know, Messi Ozil and Aaron Ramsey on the bench. I don't know what Emery's thinking of that, and it does get to a point in the season now. You know, twenty five games in, you do have to start questioning Emery, and you can say that he hasn't got much money, which is fair. Uh, hasn't been given loads to invest, which is also fair. But when you start looking at the performances on the pitch, and you question his tactics, you know why you would go. Um, away to City and concede in the first 48 seconds you know how can obviously it was an individual error with Iwobi but what does that say about the mentality of your defence when Alex Iwobi is trying to take on you know a Man City defender on the edge of his box lose possession once and does it again and ultimately leads to a goal and you know when you go 1-0 down in the game uh, so early like that we did really well to come back but Man City's dominance just shone through. I mean, there's not even point talking about... There was no contest, really. They were just a far superior side. And I think Emery really has to look at himself, too, with um, his team selection. You know, as I said, leaving Ramsey and Ozil on the bench when we got no creativity. Um, I can't even blame Aubameyang and Lacazette because there was no link. There was no link between the midfield and attack. They got no service. So how can you blame them? And um, the defence... It's shambolic. I mean, how many times do we have to say it? There's been no improvement whatsoever in the defence. Um, that's a mixture of coaching, also a mixture of a lack of quality. Um, I just want to note, you know, how Liverpool, they were poor defensively last season, brought in Van Dijk in January. You know, a leader, a big, strong defender. He transformed them. And that, do has to, that does have to do with Klopp's um, philosophy, the fact that he sets his team up to counter-press. But they've been doing less of that this season. And they have been really just relying on Van Dijk, organising, um, you know, telling people where to be at what time, getting his head on everything. And we really, really need someone like that. Whether we'll get it, I don't think so. You know, I, we've been promised the budget in the summer. What that will be will be a pittance compared to with the likes of our rivals. And it does get to that point where you do start to question... Um, where are we going? Obviously, in the last few weeks, Sven Mislintat um, has left on parted ways. And when he first when he first came, uh, he said he'd imagine spending ten to twelve years with a club. Um, he's been out in fourteen months. So, and that's the kind of guy that you wanted to look forward and um, the self sustaining structure everyone's talking about. Uh, that's the kind of guy you want to bring in players with a low fee. 
and improve them and make the team better. You know, almost when you look across at Spurs and see how good of a job they're doing, they haven't signed a player in two transfer windows. They're still above us. They're still only a couple of points behind the top two. So you have to look at that and say, you know, how are we getting it so wrong? And I think it will take a while um, if we employ a technical director. Someone needs to sort out this mess of finances. Someone needs to get these players like Mr. Ozil, you know, they need to sell them ultimately because you can't have someone who's on the bench for Man City earning 350 grand a week doesn't come on as a sub and you bring Mavropanos on. It's not on. Something needs to happen. And, you know, I think ultimately um, there needs to be a whole complete switch up um, from the board. You know, Kroenke, he's, he's, got to, he's got to go if Arsenal have any ambition of moving forward as a club. And until that happens, until there's a complete overhaul of the entire system I'm afraid it'll probably be more of the same and our second contributor this week is the brilliant Chris Davison Hi everyone I hope you're all doing okay so a 3-1 defeat for Arsenal at the Etihad yesterday am I surprised well I suppose you could say I am because 3-1 3-1 isn't a bad scoreline um, at the Etihad for any team um, to be on the losing side anyway. Uh, and when you look at our defence at the moment against that Man City attack, it probably could have been a lot worse. But, um, you know, the disappointing thing is, is obviously the defeat, of course, but to concede so early on um, in the first minute of the game um, through a, a mistake um, as well from Alex Awobi. Um, and the the lack of uh, marking that was around Aguero at that time was 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 of course like I said very disappointing and it was a bit of a blow for us a, a blow for any team to go that um, uh, down so early but um, you know we we did get back up and we we did fight and we got back into the game through the Kashani uh, equaliser and from then onwards I thought we'd done all right um, and it was just such a Shame we had to go and concede before half time as well because I genuinely do think if we were still um, level at the break, then things may have panned out differently. So to concede again just before half time was 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 a shame. Um, but look, you know, obviously the game ended three one. Man City always looked a bit more of a threat than we did. It's got it's got to be said, and we've got to be honest with ourselves. Man City are just miles above. Arsenal at the moment they've got so much quality throughout their team and Arsenal unfortunately haven't in my opinion and going forward we're we're always dangerous you know and we create a lot of chances but our defence is just far too weak and wobbly at the moment to be able to deal with teams like Man City um, and the quality that they have so of course whenever we lose I'm always disappointed but I'm not surprised that we didn't get anything out of yesterday's game. It was always going to be a very tough ask. But look, we get up, we go again, as uh, as they uh, say um, in football. And hopefully we can go and get the three points and bounce back in the next game. Because um, it's really important that we try and fight for the top four. Because it is extremely tight this year. Um, and so is sort of uh, fifth and sixth as well with uh, Man United catching up. Obviously, they've, they've just gone above us. Um, so shy is doing a great job since coming in. So it's really important that we try and get as many points as possible now and keep up the momentum, put up a fight in uh, in that top six um, part of the table and just try our hardest. Um, you know, Emery getting quite a bit of criticism again. Look, OK, fair enough. You can have your own opinion on the manager but I'm still sticking by him. I'm still going to support him for the rest of this season and through, right through to the next season as well. He needs to be given time, still very early di- days. He needs to be given a few transfer windows as well to keep building this team. Um, so it, it's obviously a season uh, which we all thought it was going to be, you know, a bumpy, a bumpy season, um, lots of ups and downs uh, and still that um, inconsistency. Um, with the with the team, um, but in my opinion, that was always going to be the case with Unai Emery's first season in charge. So he needs time. This team needs time. I'm sure some of you are getting sick and tired of hearing that, but we've got to face the reality. We want a change. We've got it, and um, now it's just about moving forward, building the team uh, how Emery wants to, and um, just seeing where things go. It's going to be touch and go, of course it is, but we've got to be patient. So onwards and upwards, we go again. Um, 
and hopefully we can get the three points and bounce back in the next game. That brings us to the end of episode 49. Thank you once again for listening. Don't forget, if you're watching on YouTube, hit that like button. Also, subscribe. If you're on iTunes, subscribe. Leave us a review. Uh, You guys know the drill by now. Also, if you're a fan of Italian football, my new podcast launched this week. Head over to Simply Serie A. That's the title. You can find it on Twitter, at Simply Serie A. It's in my bio as well. Um, But it is now available on iTunes. It's available on YouTube uh, and SoundCloud. Uh, We'll be doing our first review show, uh, and that will be out on Wednesday morning. So do stay tuned for that. Um, Plenty of action in Serie A to discuss this week. So uh, please do me a favour, support this brand new show. Um, I know it's not Arsenal related, but I'm sure there are plenty of you out there uh, who are interested in Italian football. Uh, You know, it is a very historic league. Um, and one with lots of tradition and passion uh, surrounding it. So do please check that out. Um, Big thank you once again to our sponsors, Loserport, and thank you once again to every single one of you for tuning in. I'd like to apologise for the sound quality again. I am recording this on the move, um, first day back at work uh, after my paternity leave, and to sound busy is an understatement. So I've had to record this one on my phone again, so I do apologise for that, but... I hope you've still enjoyed it and uh, I'll be back on Thursday with the preview show. So until then, take care.